During the third and fourth generation of consoles, the market was dominated by two companies, Nintendo and Sega, as they had managed to build a loyal user base throughout the 8 and 16-bit era of games. However, the home console market was about to undergo a massive shift, as the next generation would be the first built from the ground up for true 3D gaming. And during this industry-wide transition, a new contender was preparing to throw their hat into the ring with their own brand new console, the PlayStation, created by the tech giant Sony, who after being burned by both Nintendo and Sega, wanted to show the industry how much they had been underestimated. However, no one could have predicted just how successful the PlayStation would become, and ultimately how it would change the games industry forever. During the fourth generation of consoles, Nintendo and Sega were competing for market dominance after both their 16-bit machines managed to sell successfully. However, there was a bitter debate amongst gamers about which console was superior. The Sega Mega Drive, or Genesis as it's known in America, toted a faster CPU clock speed as one of its unique selling points. However, while the Super Nintendo CPU was slower, it had a host of other features to help it stand apart from the competition. Its higher resolution, wider color range, Super FX chip, and Mode 7 graphics scaler all made a good case for Nintendo's superiority. However, there was one area where Nintendo's lead was irrefutable. Its sound. The earlier generation of consoles had gotten by with more basic audio processing. However, when the 16-bit generation came around, Nintendo sounded generations ahead of Sega. Drive had its own distinctive sound, which was a bit more tinny and harsh when compared to the smooth dynamic sounds of the Super Nintendo, which had 8 times the audio RAM and 2 extra channels when compared to the Mega Drive. This was all thanks to the SSMP chip, designed and produced by Sony, but more specifically by Ken Kutaragi, who worked in Sony's research and development labs. Kutaragi was responsible for Sony and Nintendo forming this working relationship, as he saw the potential of the medium and jumped at the chance to work with Nintendo, despite the fact that Sony was keen to stay out of the games industry. Sony was well known for creating high-end consumer electronics, such as televisions, radios, home stereos, and the innovative personal cassette player, the Walkman. Sony feared that working on a games console could damage their reputation, as the games industry was still relatively new and many saw it as a children's toy and a passing fad. Sony's aversion to gaming was so strong that Kutaragi allegedly brokered the deal and developed the chip in secret, and when his superiors discovered what he'd been working on, they were furious. However, Kutaragi convinced them to allow the deal to continue, as a good working relationship with the games companies such as Nintendo could be useful in the future, and Nintendo had been very impressed with their work so far. So the two companies struck a deal. Nintendo would use Sony's audio chip, and Sony would be able to develop a disc-based add-on for the Super Nintendo, dubbed the SNES CD, similar in concept to the Famicom Disk System, previously produced by Nintendo. In addition to the add-on, Sony would also be allowed to produce a standalone console that would be compatible with Super Nintendo cartridges, and also be able to play compact discs, a format that Sony had co-created with Philips in 1982, that offered much greater storage capacity and higher fidelity audio. This standalone console was dubbed the PlayStation, and would serve as a starting point for Sony entering into the gaming industry. Kutaragi wanted to expand Nintendo's popular Super Nintendo console with a CD drive add-on, boosting the system with significant processing power and speed, as well as superior sound and storage. After the launch of the Super Nintendo, development on the SNES CD and the PlayStation began. However, during negotiations, friction between Nintendo and Sony started to arise 
as Nintendo was incredibly concerned about piracy, and wanted the Super CD to have its own proprietary format, the Super Disc, rather than a standard CD-ROM. The Super Disc was designed to be a smaller mini-disc within a plastic housing, which featured a region lockout chip on the disc, making it incredibly difficult to replicate. Compared to standard CDs, as rewritable CDs and CD burners were becoming more widely available. However, Sony was keen not to go down this route and proposed instead putting the lockout feature on the disk drive itself, but Nintendo refused to compromise on the issue. As negotiations continued, the relationship between the two companies became strained over time, which would only get worse when Nintendo would discover that Sony had an ace up their sleeve, an ace that Nintendo itself had inadvertently given them. During the initial negotiations back in 1988, Nintendo had agreed to give Sony the right to license all games for the Super CD, effectively giving Sony every penny that would be made off of any game released for the add-on. Somehow, Nintendo had slipped up. As the deal stood, Nintendo would only make money from the sales of the hardware itself, while Sony would see continual income from all CD-based games, whilst building their own PlayStation brand off the back of the Super Nintendo. When they eventually realized how much this deal was tipped in the favor of Sony, they knew something would have to be done, and quickly. As at the Consumer Electronics Show 1991, Sony announced their new console to the public, and laid out their plans for the PlayStation system, announcing that they would license it broadly to the software and game development industry, making it a much more accessible platform to release games on, maximizing their potential profits. Nintendo was keen to break out of this deal with Sony as soon as possible, so the following day at CES, they announced that they had decided to partner with Philips, the developers of the CDI, to develop their CD-based add-on instead of Sony. And also as part of the deal, some of Nintendo's original IPs would be allowed to appear on the Philips CDI. You're pretty good! Here! Yeah. Thanks! When Nintendo was questioned about backing out of their original deal with Sony, they commented, Our engineers reached the conclusion that from a technical standpoint, it was better for Nintendo to work with Philips. Despite the threat of lawsuits, Nintendo insisted the Philips deal was moving forward and that it didn't affect Sony's plans for the Super Nintendo PlayStation. Outraged, Sony's executives decided not to back out of the project and push forward. At the end of a meeting planning litigation against Nintendo, Norio Oga, president of Sony, reportedly said, We will never withdraw from this business. Keep going. However, eventually the deal between Nintendo and Sony was called off. But Sony was determined not to let their work go to waste. So they decided perhaps it was time to build some bridges with Nintendo's rival, Sega. So Olaf Olafsson, Sony Electronic Publishing president, and Mikey Shuloff, president of Sony America, approached Tom Kalinske, the CEO of Sega America, and said, Tom, we really don't like Nintendo, and you don't like Nintendo. We have this little studio in Santa Monica working on video games. We don't know what to do with it, and we'd like Sega's help in training our guys, and we think the optical disc will be the best format. Kalinske agreed with the Sony executives, and proposed a partnership to finance a small developer called Digital Pictures who would go on to create Night Trap, Sewer Shark, and Supreme Warrior for the Mega Drive CD add-on, the Sega CD. Both Sega and Sony agreed the future for consoles was the compact disc, and the next generation of consoles would have to utilize the format, and Sega was aware that their CD add-on was only scratching the surface of what the format was capable of. We had been working on the CD-ROM attachment for the Genesis, which we knew really wasn't adequate, but it taught us how to make games on this format. So Sega and Sony began to draw up specifications on a next-gen CD-based console. Then Olofsson, Shulov, and Kalinsky took these specifications to Japan and presented them to Ken Kutaragi, who loved the idea and proposed that Sega and Sony could work together on this console, stating, As we all lose money on hardware, let's jointly market a single system, the Sega slash Sony hardware system, and whatever loss we make, we split that loss. The idea made sense to Kalinsky, so he took the concept to Sega of Japan, where it was quickly shot down. They said, that's a stupid idea. Sony doesn't know how to make hardware. They don't know how to make software either. Why would we want to do this? Kutaragi was once again left disappointed and angered by Nintendo and Sega's actions. However, he remained certain that their concept and design for the PlayStation had potential. So he approached Norio Oga, president of Sony, explaining that he felt Sony should proceed with the development on their own. Growing weary of all the false starts on the PlayStation, Oga wanted to seize the opportunity to get back at Nintendo and told Kutaragi, just do it. 
so Kutaragi moved his PlayStation team over to Sony Music, a separate entity within Sony, who had a reputation for attracting and nurturing talent. The PlayStation team leveraged Sony Music's experience to establish a huge sales team that would attract developers to work with Sony as they offered the developers more control over distribution. As previously, many had found the process of working with Sega and Nintendo had some difficulties, so with the PlayStation team positioned inside of Sony Music, it meant they had direct control of their disc pressing facilities, which in time would prove to be a key advantage for Sony. As previously, Nintendo had been incredibly strict with distribution, as only Nintendo could manufacture and supply cartridges for their game, and they would even decide how many the developer could receive. When the PlayStation sales team presented their plans for distribution to game publishers and developers at a meeting in Tokyo in 1994, the response was electric. Finally, Japanese developers could have a say on how their games were sold, an area of business that was previously completely controlled by Nintendo. Publishers and game creators were attracted to Sony's incredibly fast certification process. It would last no more than two weeks, compared to the months it would take with Sega and Nintendo. Sony would also offer far more reasonable royalty rates. Another advantage to releasing on the PlayStation was that Sony did not yet have its own first-party games in development, meaning that there was less competition on the system and developers had a decent chance for their games to stand out or even become the new flagship franchise for the system. Sony had found a gap in Nintendo's armor, and they weren't hesitating to make the most of the opportunity. They managed to draw in numerous big developers to come over, including EA, Namco, and Squaresoft. Hype around the PlayStation was building, and it seemed like the scrappy newcomer was about to give the old guard a run for their money. However, many were still wondering what this console and its games would actually look like. The console itself was built with a minimalist design that didn't look out of place next to Sony's premium consumer electronics. It aimed for a more mature look, as Kudaragi's vision for the PlayStation was to break the stigma of consoles being toys for kids and wanted a console that could be enjoyed by all ages. The controller was designed to be accessible and familiar to players, building on the standard conventions that players had become accustomed to, whilst also having its own personality. Its primary influence was the SNES controller. The Super NES was a huge hit at the time, and naturally we wanted SNES gamers to upgrade to our system. That's why the management department didn't want the controller to be a radical departure. They said it had to be a standard type of design, or gamers wouldn't accept it. Both have four face buttons, start, select, and a D-pad. However, the PlayStation added two additional shoulder buttons. Also, the design team decided to change the lettered buttons popularized by Nintendo and opted to instead use symbols that would more easily translate across languages, and each symbol had an intended use. We wanted something simple to remember, which is why we went with icons or symbols. I gave each symbol a meaning and a color. The triangle refers to viewpoint. I had it represent one's head or direction, and made it green. Square refers to a piece of paper. I had it to represent menus or documents, and made it pink. The circle and X represent yes or no decision making. I made them red and blue respectively. When the PlayStation's capabilities were first shown to the public, it wowed the industry with its live 3D rendering capabilities, perhaps most famously its T-Rex demo, that featured a detailed model of a T-Rex that could be rotated and controlled. When developing the PlayStation, Kutaragi was aiming to balance the conflicting goals of high performance, low cost, and being easy to program for. Whilst the Sega Saturn was on paper the more powerful console, and was capable of some impressive visuals, the system's architecture was overly complex and hard to develop for, so the PlayStation opted for simplicity, making it easier for developers to optimize their games, often resulting in the PlayStation version being superior. The PlayStation 1 featured a 32-bit single-core CPU running at 33 MHz. Within the CPU, there are additional coprocessors such as the Geometry Transform Engine that would handle vector math instructions used for 3D graphics. The Motion Decoder, or MDEC, enables full-screen high-quality FMV playback and is responsible for decompressing images and video into VRAM. And the System Control coprocessor that controls memory management. The system also had 2 megabytes of RAM and a 32-bit GPU with 1 megabyte of dedicated video RAM, which was capable of outputting a maximum resolution of 480i. The console also featured a dedicated sound processing unit for processing high-quality 16-bit audio that was capable of decompressing sound in real time. 
It also featured an optical disk drive that was capable of playing audio CDs as well as PlayStation game discs that could store up to 650 megabytes of data, which was a massive upgrade over the typical cartridge size, allowing more space for higher quality audio and full motion video. The PlayStation game discs themselves featured a black underside, which Sony claimed was a form of copy protection. However, the black plastic used was transparent to any infrared laser, and did not itself pose an obstacle to duplicators or computer CD drives, although it may have helped consumers to distinguish between unofficial copies and genuine official games. In previous generations, most game cartridges featured built-in memory for players to save their progress in-game. However, with CDs, there was no way for a player to store their game save on the disc. So Sega had opted to use a dedicated game cartridge for storing game saves. Sony followed suit, but made this solution a bit more elegant with memory cards, which were small proprietary cards that would be easier to transport, so players could take their saves to their friend's house and even copy it to their friend's memory card. Nintendo and Sega had a huge share of the gaming market, and diehard fans were eagerly awaiting their 3D console debut. So Sony was doing their best to turn heads and win over consumers and developers. But with the PlayStation set to launch alongside the Saturn, had they done enough to make the PlayStation a success? The PlayStation launched first in Japan on December 3rd, 1994, to much anticipation. However, there was still some concern internally about how the console might perform, as it was releasing just one week after the highly anticipated Sega Saturn, which was launching with the impressive console port of Virtua Fighter as an exclusive, which had proved to be a massive success, selling out of their stock of 200,000 consoles on its first day. Sony was still nervous about how their first game console would be received, so in a bid to distance themselves from the console, Sony sent notices to the marketing teams insisting that the console was referred to as PlayStation and not Sony PlayStation, a clear distancing of the two brands in case the launch was to fail. However, even after the successful launch of the Saturn, the PlayStation hype managed to endure as Sony had made the decision to price the PlayStation incredibly competitively, launching at a lower price of 39,800 yen, in comparison to the Saturn's 44,800 yen. The PlayStation also boasted more games available at launch, including the visually stunning Ridge Racer. And when the PlayStation's launch came around, it was a huge success, as there were queues of fans waiting for their chance to get their hands on Sony's first console on day one. And by the end of the day, they had sold an impressive 100,000 PlayStations. By the end of 1994, the Saturn was leading in sales, with half a million consoles sold. However, the PlayStation was managing to keep pace with 300,000 units sold. And the race was far from over as both companies were now setting their sights on the West. And with no sign of Nintendo launching their next generation console, the market was wide open for both PlayStation and Saturn to establish a lead. Sony did not want to let this opportunity go to waste. So they hired an industry veteran, Steve Race, a former Sega and Nintendo executive who was known for his aggressive business tactics to lead Sony's Western marketing push. Sega, however, was now wary of the success that Sony had already seen in Japan and wanted to move quickly to try and take the sales lead in the West. So on May 11th, E3 of 95 took place and Sega announced that they had secretly shipped Saturns to retailers across the US and they would be available to buy it that very same day at the price of $3.99 an incredibly aggressive price point, as consoles generally have been sold for more premium prices in the West. The pressure was now on for Sony. Sega had done everything to try and steal the newcomer's thunder, and now many were unsure if Sony would even be able to match Sega's price in the US. As in Japan, the PlayStation's lower cost meant that the system actually was sold at a loss to Sony. The next day, all eyes were on Sony as they took to the stage. They started with a video showing the company's various achievements and proudly announcing their entry into the games industry. However, things would quickly grind to a halt as it was followed up with a long-winded and uninspired slideshow presentation that didn't excite the audience too much. All authorized worldwide operations for Sony businesses include Sony Computer Entertainment of America, Sony Computer Entertainment of Europe, Sony InnoShop, and Sony Signosis. He also oversees sales and marketing operations for Sony CD-ROM manufacturing business. Many wondered why after the Saturn's impressive showing, Sony would be so content to seemingly waste people's time. However, it would quickly become clear that Sony had been planning something. 
and they were about to play their hand as Steve Race took to the stage for an announcement that would change everything. Two ninety nine. Cerny had done it. The price point was much lower than expected. However, the price wouldn't be the only thing to turn heads, as the games on display during the show, including Ridge Racer, Wipeout, and Tekken, quickly excited gamers, and also a surprise appearance from Michael Jackson ensured that Sony left a huge impression with their US debut. Although many expected Sega to have an aggressive lead following their surprise early launch, it ultimately left them at a massive disadvantage, as the system only had six games at launch, and Virtua Fighter was not very popular in the West. Retailers were also upset by the surprise launch, as they were not informed ahead of time. Best Buy, Walmart, and KB Toys were actually so angered they refused to sell any Sega products. Sega had pushed forward too quickly and tripped themselves up, and Sony was aggressively heading for first place. The lower price point and Sony's forward-thinking advertising that targeted not just teenagers, but also young adults, with sponsored events at nightclubs and licensed music in their adverts, made consumers sure that the PlayStation was the console worth waiting for. And when it launched on September 9th, 1995, retailers reported that they didn't have enough stock to keep up with demand. There were over 100,000 pre-orders placed for the PlayStation and 12 games available by the time of its American launch, which was far more appealing in comparison to Saturn's six launch titles. Within two days, it had already sold more consoles than the Saturn had in five months. Sony had taken a strong lead that continued for their European and Australian launch on the 29th of September and the 15th of November. By November, it had already outsold the Saturn by a factor of three in the United Kingdom. And within its first year, the PlayStation secured over 20% of the entire US video game market. And by the end of 95, over 800,000 consoles had been sold in the US alone. The PlayStation was on track to win this generation. However, Nintendo were still absent, and a substantial buzz was building for their new console, the Nintendo 64, which was set to be the most powerful console of the generation, with many innovative features such as 360 analog control, four controller ports, and controller rumble. When the Nintendo 64 finally launched in 1996, it sold well, but was ultimately steamrolled by the PlayStation. Over time, Sony began to iterate upon their hardware to compete more with the N64's unique features. In 1997, Sony launched the Dual Analog Controller, which offered two analog sticks and rumble, although this was only in the Japanese version. A few months later, Sony replaced this controller with the DualShock, which updated the thumbstick's design and added the ability for them to be clicked in, adding two extra buttons, R3 and L3 respectively, and also controller rumble was included for the US and Europe as well as Japan. The PlayStation Multitap was also released, which allowed for four-player multiplayer on supported games, or even up to eight players with a second multitap. Later into the PlayStation's lifespan, on July 7th, 2000, Sony released a slimmer, more compact version of the PlayStation, known as the PS1, that could also be bought bundled with a screen that would allow for more portable play. The PlayStation 1 had an impressively long life as a console, as it saw support long after it was succeeded by the PlayStation 2, selling millions of units until it was discontinued in 2006. The PlayStation absolutely dominated the fifth generation of consoles, shipping a mass of 102.49 million units. And to date, the PlayStation 1 is the fifth best-selling console of all time. Whilst the hardware and pricing was a huge part of the console's success, ultimately, a console is defined by its games. And PlayStation offered up a massive lineup of diverse games, some of which would go on to become landmark titles in gaming history. Due to Sony's forward-thinking licensing, the console proved incredibly popular with developers. So popular, in fact, that over 7,918 games were released for the console during its lifespan, with accumulative sales of 962 million units. That's an incredibly high number when compared to the Saturn's 1,047 games and the N64's paltry 393 games. 
Looking at the top selling games for the PlayStation, you can see a diverse range of genres and many popular series which started or gained their popularity on the PlayStation 1, which are a staple in the industry even to this day. Gran Turismo was the highest selling game on the PlayStation and offered up an immensely realistic and expansive driving experience that raised the bar for the racing genre, featuring impressive graphics, realistic car handling and officially licensed music as well as 233 officially licensed cars that could all be tuned and upgraded. On top of this, the game also boasted an in-depth career mode which had the player racing to earn money to buy cars, parts and pass different license tests to unlock higher class vehicles and events. Gran Turismo also saw a sequel with Gran Turismo 2, which continued to add to the series and also sold incredibly well, being the third highest selling game on the system. Squaresoft was also drawn to the PlayStation, bringing the previously Nintendo exclusive Final Fantasy to release on the PlayStation, beginning with the massively acclaimed Final Fantasy VII, which has been credited with popularizing the role-playing genre in the US and Europe thanks to its impressive scale, cinematic cutscenes, immersive narrative and well-developed characters. The impact of Final Fantasy VII was massive, and many still to this day consider it to be one of, if not the best games ever released. It went on to be the second highest selling title on the PlayStation, and the next games in the series, Final Fantasy VIII and IX also sold incredibly well, becoming the fourth and fifteenth best selling games as well. Konami also opted to support the PlayStation, and in doing so, managed to bring one of the most forward-thinking and iconic games of the 90s to fruition, with the third title in the Metal Gear series, Metal Gear Solid, created by the visionary game director Hideo Kojima. MGS is a stealth game heavily inspired by Kojima's love of Western cinema. The story tells a deep narrative which sees the player entangled in a web of military and political conspiracy, involving unique and well-developed characters, all shown with an incredibly cinematic flair that really hadn't been seen in gaming before. The game also featured a number of unique mechanics and systems that were incredibly ahead of their time, such as enemies in-game reacting to sounds and environmental cues such as following the character's footprints. Although previous games in the series had sold well, it was this third entry that would make the series popular in the West, and would also be credited with popularizing the stealth genre, as the game received industry-wide acclaim, with many stating it was one of the best games ever released. Metal Gear Solid went on to become the 12th best-selling game on the PlayStation, and a landmark achievement in gaming. Early on in the PlayStation's development, they attracted arcade giant Namco, who in turn brought impressive ports of their arcade hits such as Ridge Racer to the PlayStation, which managed to turn heads at the console's launch and would ultimately sell incredibly well and go on to have four games released for the PlayStation. Also Namco ported their light gun shooters Time Crisis and Point Blank to the PlayStation, as well as their 3D arcade fighter Tekken, which received a near flawless port to the PlayStation, and would go on to see three games released on the PS1, each one adding more fighters and further refining its gameplay and style. The home console versions of Tekken would feature more content than its arcade counterparts, with console-exclusive characters and modes. At the release of Tekken 3, it was showered with praise, receiving many near-perfect scores. It went on to become the most popular fighting game on the system, and is still considered to be one of the best fighting games of all time. Overall, the PlayStation had an incredible amount of varied titles that helped the console appeal to a wider demographic. With fast-paced arcade racers like the Wipeout series, mascot platformers like Crash Bandicoot and Spyro, as well as games that were aimed at more mature audiences, such as the wildly successful Tomb Raider series, or even Resident Evil, which popularized the survival horror genre. The PlayStation truly offered something for everyone, and in this list we've barely scratched the surface of some of the best titles and cult classics for the system. The PlayStation changed the gaming industry almost overnight. After being passed over by both Nintendo and Sega, Sony managed to defy expectations and become the biggest company in gaming with just one console. Sega were on the ropes, and Nintendo had been dealt a huge blow. 3D gaming had truly arrived on home consoles. Technology was improving quicker than ever before, so now everyone was looking to see what was next for Sony. Was the PlayStation just beginner's luck? Or could Sony make lightning strike twice? Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this video. I want to give a huge shout out to my friend Chris Ward, who did the 3D models that you saw in this video. 
He's a fantastic artist and it's been really fun working with 3D models and I think it's added an extra level to this video that I wouldn't have been able to do on my own. So thanks so much to him. And uh, I want to say thank you to any of my subscribers who might have been waiting for this video. I know it's been a long time since I uploaded, but uh, this year has been a bit crazy and I stopped working freelance earlier this year and started a full-time position, which meant I didn't have as much time to edit as I did before. And for anyone who's been waiting for the next Smash video, I want to thank you for your patience. But the next video is most definitely Smash 4. And then possibly after that, hopefully Smash Bros Ultimate, if all the DLC is out, we'll see what state the game's in at that point. But uh, I want to thank you so much once again for watching. If you'd like to see more and you're not subscribed already, please hit the subscribe button. Uh, if you drop the video a like, it really, really does help this to get recommended to other people who might enjoy it. Once again, thank you so much, and I'll see you guys in the next video.